I think, I think there might be a party going on over there. I don't know for sure. Welcome back. You're about to have an opportunity to listen to a very outstanding individual, Jonathan Wiesgall. Jonathan is the Vice President of Legislative Af Regulatory Affairs for Brookshire Hathaway Energy Company, a subsidiary of Brookshire Hathaway. He's the Vice President uh, of Brookshire. He actually was involved with Cal Energy early on. He was Vice President of Legislative and Regulatory Affairs. He's a really interesting individual. If you've been to the summits before, you know what you're about to hear. It's just a total insight as to where energy is coming from, where it's going to. Uh, he, uh, interestingly enough, he's an adjunct professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center. He's taught seminars on energy issues since 1990. He's also a guest lecturer on energy issues at Stanford Law, Haverville, and Johns Hopkins Environmental Science and Policy. He's a graduate of Columbia College and Stanford Law School. And um, Jonathan, come on up. Thanks very much, Tom. Yes, we did, we did start 35 years ago as, as Cal Energy. We've been changing our name on a regular basis to try to stay away from the creditors. We became Mid-American Energy Holdings Company. We were purchased by Berkshire Hathaway in 2000, uh, but changed the name to Berkshire Hathaway Energy. Last year, uh, Cal Energy is now BHE uh, Renewables, uh, but uh, we get our act together reasonably well. I, uh, um, I would, uh, I generally like to talk about what's going on in Washington, D.C. and then focus on California. I can, I can handle Washington, D.C. pretty quickly. Um, nothing's going on in Washington, D.C. Uh, the, the Republican-controlled Senate is moving with the same alacrity as the Democratic-controlled Senate did on, on, on energy issues. It took about five weeks to get Keystone vetoed, which could have happened in a couple of days. It took about three weeks to fund Homeland Security, which is not energy, but that could have been done. But, but I, uh, in fairness, below the surface, um, there really is a desire among Democrats and Republicans on the relevant Senate committees uh, to see if some energy legislation can't be crafted this, this year. Uh, you have a chairwoman on the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, Lisa Murkowski, very reasonable, quite a, a, looking for solutions, not looking for message bills of, of let's get Keisto done or let's kill the EPA, and, and a, a, a ranking member from, from the state of Washington, Maria Cantwell. Um, so I think there really will be an effort to, to, to do something uh, on the federal level around the edges um, because of the animosity and, and, and the ongoing gridlock. I, uh, I really don't have any real insights, other insights on Washington. I, I, I finally now seeing that Jeb Bush has, is going to be joining the race. I finally understand what the Bush administration meant by no child left behind. Um, <laughs> but but um, uh, beyond that, uh, really, really don't know. Uh, that's not my line, but it is a good one. I like to use it. Um, I want to talk, I want to focus, I'm, I'm going to chat for a while and then we're going to have a very good panel, uh, which will be more interesting than just listening to me, but I want to talk about two big themes facing California, change, change in the electricity markets and regional solutions. Um, on change, a uh, lot change in so many different areas and changes on, at the federal level as well. Um, let me start with the little area, the workforce. Uh, we've got an aging workforce. There's concern about safety. There's concern about minimum wage. There have been charges of one utility firing domestic workers and hiring foreign workers uh, under the H-1B visa program. Um, I'm, I'm here just to set the record straight on one, one issue. Berkshire Hathaway Energy is not guilty of any of that. Let's, let's take the issue of vegetation at our solar sites. Very important to keep that vegetation low so that it doesn't obscure the solar panels. Well, this calls for new jobs, and we're bringing new folks into the workforce, um, young workers, uh, many of them single. Um, um, uh, for some, it's their first real job. Um, <laughs> they're well-fed. 
Um, they're safe, except for some who like to chew on cables to get that little extra taste. Uh, they're 100% domestic, uh, and as far as I know, some of them even are domesticated. But anyway, um, that's my humor for the day. Okay. Uh, on, a, on the serious note, there are big changes coming, both at the federal level and the state level. At the federal level, I'm going to talk about the EPA's Rule 111D. At the federal level, changes in tax incentives. At the state level, Steve already referred to the 50-50-50. Uh, vision of the governor getting to 50% renewables, cutting petroleum use 50%, increasing building energy efficiency 50%. I'm only going to focus on the, on the first third there, the, the electricity side, the energy side, but I will say that if California doesn't address petroleum and building efficiency with the same uh, degree of, of urgency that it does on electricity side, we're never going to get to those 2030 goals. Um, and on the electricity side, the change, it's not going to be taking a piece of legislation that says 33% 2020 and simply crossing out 33 and saying 50% 20, uh, 20, sorry, 33% by 2020, crossing it out saying 50% by 2030. If anything, and I'll talk more about it in our panel may also, I think we may be moving from a, from a renewable portfolio standard concept to just a greenhouse gas emissions concept, which is an easier way to measure all of this, and it's kind of what the EPA is doing. As we move to 50%, another big change. Geothermal can play a big role in getting the state uh, to 50%, replacing natural gas-fired plants. Um, other changes, I'm going to talk about an energy imbalance market uh, as a theme of regional solutions. It really is time California has got to embrace renewables on a regional wide basis. The current RPS, Renewable Portfolio Standard Legislation, reserves pretty large quotas for power that can be easily transmitted into California. California now gets about 15% of its solar and nearly half its wind from outside the state. That's good news. These out-of-state renewable resources can help balance the grid. Uh, they can save California money. Uh, they minimize greenhouse gases. So, and, and with the famous duck chart that I did not bring with me to put up, but I think all of you know that with upwards of 10, 12, 13,000 megawatts of solar coming online in the next five or six years, there's going to be a huge amount of overgeneration from 10 in the morning till 5 in the afternoon. Something's got to be done about that. Regional solutions can help. As Governor Brown himself has said, California is a leader in renewable energy. I would add that part of being a leader is not going first, it's having followers. Uh, a leader with no followers is a person taking a walk. Um, uh, California can pursue a goal of 50% renewables uh, without a regional approach, but it's going to take longer, it's going to be more expensive. And the, this overgeneration problem could really threaten politically to hurt the state. It could hurt the renewable energy industry uh, as a whole. It could be self-defeating. So how to deal with these problems. Let me start with, I want to talk really about two more technical issues, this energy imbalance market and 111D. So let me, let me start a bit with another company that we own called MidAmerican Energy uh, uh, in Iowa. We've been doing wind since 2004. We've got well over 3,000 megawatts of wind today. Um, we actually will have enough wind so that by next year it will represent almost half the needs of our retail customers. Uh, yeah, we've got a total of about 4,400 megawatts of wind as a company, which is not far behind the entire state of California. Iowa gets 27% of its electricity from wind today. California's got a lot, but it's a much bigger state. It gets about 6%. So the question in Iowa we have, how do you dispatch, how do you sell, how do you utilize that much wind, 50% of your system? How do you, how do you dispatch, dispatch that much wind onto the grid? Answer, find a large grid. And that's what we did. Um, uh, we couldn't operate those assets today nearly as economically without joining the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, a large grid covering 15 states, 
parts of 15 states from Louisiana up to North Dakota, Montana, and into Manitoba. Um, it reduces our balancing costs dramatically. We learned firsthand that being part of a large grid like that uh, helps better manage the variability of wind, reduces the overall capacity needs, uh, and it results it's just a more economic placement um, of the wind, and we've seen lower prices for customers. So let's go west. We also own a utility called Pacific Corp, which has uh, customers in parts of six western states. California, Oregon, Washington, Utah, Idaho, um, and um, uh, Wyoming. Uh, not that many in California, only about 44,000 in the northern part of the state. But we've got about 3,000 megawatts of renewables, um, including uh, hydro. So again, how do we optimize uh, those assets? Do we join a big grid where we can, where someone will need those renewables at any time? Hard to do, because when you go west of the Colorado, yes, you see the Cal ISO as a pretty big balancing authority, but the west has 38 separate grids. Compare that to the rest of the country. PJM, Southwest Power Pool, and, the, and MISO. The west, 38 separate balancing authorities. They operate on an hourly basis by manually dispatching resources. Uh, very little situational awareness of what's going on outside their balancing authorities. Very costly. Uh, and, and as you all know, the fluctuations um, in renewable energy generation with wind and solar, uh, they're difficult for grid operators to manage because of the limited pool of generation resources that each one of these smaller balancing authority has. And they, it requires each one of them to have higher levels of reserves uh, to cover these unexpected changes. Um, now, the grid obviously responds to these changes. The lights are staying on here. They stay on there. We haven't had a big blackout for years. But there's no commercial structure. There's no organized market that, that can optimize uh, this supply response. Um, you know, energy transfers among these 38 are done hourly. Oh, thanks very much. Um, energy transfers are done hourly. Um, uh, it makes it difficult to match supply and demand, especially when the wind will come up quickly or go or on a partly cloudy day. So what's the answer? The answer that we pursued with the Cal, Cal ISO is an energy imbalance market. We entered into an agreement several years ago. Um, we went live just November 1 of last year. Um, and here's what it looks like. This is the Cal ISO. These are the areas of California, Oregon, Washington, Utah, Wyoming, and Idaho that Pacific Corp serves. So we're putting together a rather large balancing authority. And here in green, another utility we own, NV Energy, will join this market come October 1 of this year. What does it do? I talked about it a little bit last year. I said it was match.com for electrons. That's not totally inaccurate. I mean, through, through automatic bids um, or economic bids, it, it automatically balances supply and demand um, by choosing the least cost resource. And that's the key point. It leverages this geographic diversity. And it's, 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 it, this is not rocket science. If you've got a balancing authority, a grid this large, obviously, if the wind is blowing here and not here, but you can, on a five-minute basis, take advantage of the different resources, you can better utilize these renewable resources because you've got a bigger geographic uh, field. So it's about optimization. It's about utilizing existing resources. So it will let the grid operators uh, f fold in renewable in these real-time increments to, to better match these fluctuations. And rather than having fossil fuel power plants on reserve, ready to ramp up as necessary uh, for declines in wind and solar. Participants in this energy imbalance market, because we hope it's more than us and the Cal ISO, uh, can draw on a greater number of resources from across the West. Um, so let's go back to that example. You all know of that duck chart, of that huge amount of overgeneration um, that is going to be, that is already happening in California. Uh, some of that solar, um, 
is, is, is already, uh, is, has already been terminated. I mean, think of it. California, the leader in renewable energy, um, uh, having to waste renewable energy that's produced, having to curtail some of that solar because there's just no place for it to go. We are in the last couple of months when there's been excess solar here in California, uh, Pacific Corp on the, in the, on the market, it's been bid and it's been utilized in other parts of this grid. So it works. I mean, think about the three things you do as a utility. You want to supply electricity to your customers that's affordable, reliable, and sustainable. This market actually does all three. We joined it because we saw the cost savings. And in the first study that came out only about four weeks ago, the Cal ISO showed that at least for, I guess, the first two months, November, December, um, the savings are exactly what were predicted, about $6 million of benefits uh, in those first two months. Um, sustainability, uh, obviously, improved renewable integration. You're just capturing the benefits of a greater geographic footprint. You optimize your renewable energy. And reliability, much better visibility. We don't, we don't monetize this, but it's been a side benefit of being able to look into each other's systems better um, and, and, and providing uh, uh, certainly better responsiveness to grid conditions across the West. And the beauty of this energy imbalance market, no federal legislation, no state legislation. Yes, it had to be studied, and a lot of people put a lot of time into it, but it involved, one fi it involved filing at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission for a tariff. Um, I'm biased, I, but I do think the energy imbalance market can be a huge tool uh, to transform Western energy markets and renewable markets. And it doesn't involve even building more renewable resources. It optimizes what's there. So it's good news for customers. Uh, it's good news for renewables. And it's certainly good news for, for the oversupply challenges. Now, just last week, another utility, Puget Sound Energy, announced that they will be joining. And that's kind of big, because Puget Sound Energy is up here near Seattle. They actually don't even abut California. But for them, even through the trans transmission transfers, they still see enough, enough cost savings. So what's the theme there? It's my second theme after change. Regional solutions are the way to go. Now let me pivot and talk about Rule 111D. It's an EPA rule, equally wonkish but important. And I'm going to tie it back to energy and balance market. Um, in a nutshell. This is, you may not be following that closely in California because California with such strong renewables and a cap and trade system is not as adversely affected as other states. But this is a rule, a proposed rule that will become final this summer uh, from the Environmental Protection Agency that will regulate states, not power plants, states, develop plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Across the board, about a 30% cut in carbon emissions from existing U.S. power plants by 2030, 30% below 2005 levels. Now that's a huge challenge. It's one thing to put in standards for new power plants. These are standards for existing fossil fuel plants. Um, these reductions vary state by state. Um, EPA recognized, I mean, looked at what each state could achieve. Uh, the rule talks about, I'm quoting here, a unique mix of emissions and power sources. So a state like Washington, um, which already has an incredibly low emissions rate. Of, it's measured in pounds per megawatt hour. Um, Washington's being asked to make a 71% cut all the way down to 215 pounds per megawatt hour. Uh, North Dakota at 1,800 pounds is only being asked to make an 11% cut. Kentucky, 95% reliant on coal, up also around 1,700 pounds of, of CO2 per megawatt hour being asked to make only uh, about an 18 percent cut, um, simply because it's just not realistic for Kentucky to shut down all of its coal plants right away. Um, it's a very complicated rule. Um, it's, it's a rate-based rule. Reduce your rate by a certain level. You can, you can do this on a, on a, on a mass-based rate, like a cap, saying here's the total emissions, here are the total tons you can emit. This is tons per megawatt hour. Tailpipe rules are, are rate-based. The NOx rules, the SOx rules are rate-based. Um, 
It's not unlike what the Waxman-Markey bill tried to do several years ago in Congress, but that was also a mass-based rule. Um, so it establishes, the rule establishes, a best system of emission reductions, BSER, for states based on four building blocks. I'll go through them very quickly, but one is just increase the energy efficiency of coal plants. Uh, the second, increase utilization of existing natural gas-fired plants. In fact, some say this is a gas rule. Get up to 70% capacity factors. So a state like Arizona has got a lot of underutilized gas. Can they ramp up to 70%? Sure. Um, you know, where are the contracts, where are the pipelines to get the gas? A lot of challenges. Third bucket, very important, and that's where I'm going to circle back to energy imbalance, increased deployment of zero emitting resources, i.e. renewables. And then a fourth bucket of just increased energy efficiency. And the rule, it's a, it's a, re, it's, it's a very ambitious rule. It's going to be challenged. It's already being challenged in the courts. The Supreme Court will finally have to make a decision at some point. But it is designed also to give maximum flexibility to the states. So it says, look, use these four buckets if you've got other ideas, um, uh, fuel switching, for example, or overachieve in one bucket, like do more renewables, but you can't achieve uh, an overall, let's say, 6% improvement in existing coal plants. All of it's designed to give great flexibility to states. Now, I'm talking about this because that third bullet has led some people to say, well, maybe the answer here for all these different states is to look at some regional solutions, regional cooperation. Um, the East Coast already has the, the REGI system, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, um, uh, where states can trade and maybe meet regional goals of these rate reductions. Um, it's a good idea. I think there are a number of impediments there. One is the clock. Um, the interim rule, uh, if this rule becomes final, the, the first uh, compliance date is 2020. That's tomorrow if you're a utility. I mean, if you're really looking at bringing on more gas and putting in more pipelines to bring that gas in, that's a short period of time. If you're looking to form a regional trading market, Reggie took six years to do. Um, and plans have to be filed by 2016 or, in some cases, 2017. Uh, I just don't know if that's enough time to meet that first compliance date. Uh, problem two is changing politics. Um, you know, Governor Christie pulled New Jersey out of Reggie. Uh, the Western Climate Initiative, uh, as far as I know, is kind of moribund. Um, uh, you know, a governor can come into uh, power from a different political party and say, we want out. Um, a third impediment is the parochial factor. Let's face it, politicians like to cut ribbons. Politicians like the tax base. They like the jobs in their states. That's logical. Um, uh, that, that, that conflicts with this notion of regional solutions. Um, but, you know, uh, if, if there's a savings of looking at out-of-state solutions, we gotta, we've got to take a look at it. And the fourth problem is just the relative position of the state. I mean, we're in, 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 in Iowa where our utility will have no problem meeting these standards because of such a high level of renewables that we have. We have other states kind of knocking on Iowa's door like Missouri and Nebraska saying, hey, you want to do a little regional deal here? You have to, the state of Iowa, not, not our utility, the state is saying, well, what's in it for us? I mean, why should we help out a state that's going to have a, a difficult compliance role? And the answer is, well, if there could be a trading system, or if Iowa could make money, or if California could make money, you know, maybe we'll see. This energy imbalance market some see as a tool for the West. We did not set this up with a Cal ISO with that in, with that in mind, but it certainly could lend itself. Um, I think we have to wait to see the final rule. Um, it's unlikely that this can be designed, a, a, a big regional program to solve each state's problems can be designed quickly enough. But there's no question that the market itself uh, will certainly deliver less expensive renewable energy. So that's where I see 111D going. Let me quickly touch on one other big change. Uh, renewable energy incentives at the federal level. The barriers, be it geothermal, wind, solar, biomass, the barriers have been this boom-bust cycle. 
of tax incentives. The production tax credit first was passed in 1992. Geothermal didn't get it even until 2005. And it's been, it's been boom and bust. It's expired, it's been renewed, it's been expired again. Um, uh, the renewable integration challenges are huge. Uh, and low natural gas prices are an immense challenge, not just for renewables, but for nuclear as well. Um, on the drivers, three big drivers, tax policies, and for geothermal and wind, primarily the production tax credit, for solar, the investment tax credit, second driver, state RPS programs, and the third is this 111D or other EPA rules, like its mercury and air toxic rules, that has already led to the shutdown of a number of coal plants, so that's kind of an indirect driver. Well, one of these drivers is dead. The production tax credit does not exist anymore. It may be reinstated, it may be extended, uh, but it expired at the end of 2014. Bit of a debacle in the lame duck session. It almost made it across the barrier, uh, uh, across the goal line, but it didn't. The investment tax credit has got uh, two more years to run. It does not expire till the end of 2016. Uh, that's a 30% investment credit used mostly by solar, but can be used by, by geothermal. Um, when that expires, if it's not renewed, that 30% goes down to 10. So it's not quite as draconian as the complete demise of the production tax credit, which has really been a huge driver, mostly for wind. I mean, wind has used 90, 98, 99% of those tax dollars. Geothermal has never really found a good, a good incentive program at the federal level. But we'll work through it, and the state will work through it. It's, it's, you know, you like to have carrots and sticks, and the production tax credit has been a great carrot. If you build it, here's what you get. Take away that carrot, it's just going to be a little bit more difficult. Um, the challenge here in California is how, how to optimize the system. I think we're done with the days of just buying more renewables, having more uh, solicitations, just kind of seeing what PPA you can get, go on to the next deal. Um, I think there's a need for better overall planning. I want to get into that with our panel. I think it's time to stop of thinking of renewables as something special, as some sort of niche. I mean, if the governor is serious about his goal and we can get there and renewables are going to be 50% of the electricity base, they're going to be the workhorse of the system. Um, you know, not, not this little dessert menu. And they've got to supply grid reliability. That's where I see a greater role for geothermal. We've talked, there's always this, this the, the mantra, the, the, the CPUC regulations of let's get least cost, best fit. It's become a bit of a fiction because least cost, best fit for years has been least cost, least cost, least cost. Well, I think now it's going to be time not to ignore cost, but to look at, at reliability. What's going to help on greenhouse gas reduction? That's really best fit. Um, buying renewables with, with greenhouse gas reductions in mind, with cost, with reliability. And we're seeing some interesting legislation in Sacramento. That's the other big change. Senator Hertzberg has a very interesting bill to expand direct access. Right now, direct access where a company can contract with the XYZ solar company um, Obviously, it connects to the grid, but they can say, okay, we're 100% solar because we're buying from XYZ. Uh, that's limited. There's a cap on 12% on, on California's load. Hertzberg's office says there's as much as 25% of the load that wants direct access. Those data centers that, that, that Steve talked about. Uh, we do them in Iowa. We've got Google, Facebook, Microsoft. They all wanted that wind. They want to be able, the customers want the renewables. University of California wants it. Um, now, just to offer direct access, clearly that's a big threat to utilities. Maybe there's a need to get a direct access bill that provides for a greener product than the utilities can offer today. That, that could be where that goes. Uh, Senator weso has got a very important bill that says, okay, we're doing all these renewables. What's happening about real economic development? I don't have to go into the challenges facing Imperial County other than to say that a decade ago, when California started looking at 10 and 20 percent renewables, everybody said, boy, Imperial County is going to clean up. And that's just not been the case. Imperial has lagged behind other counties. Other changes we're seeing, transparency. Lots of problems at the CPUC. Um, you know, if you don't know what relative costs are, it's kind of hard to adjust your planning. 
Um, so I think we're going to see some changes there as well. The Salton Sea has got to be addressed, as other speakers have already said. It, it, it just can't be this sinkhole of, of impossibility. There are huge challenges. There are nasty problems. The solutions are elusive. But you've got to get started somewhere. And I think I'm, I'm hopeful that, that we're going to see that. Uh, I think that you could tie in geothermal base load, 50% renewables, water problems, and the like. Um, it's got to happen. But we are really at the beginning of a new era. The, 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 I don't think California planned for success. We're reaching 33% renewables. Who'd have thunk it? But now we've got to really look at the, at the real challenges. I mean, what California does will have a big influence around the country, and how the West puts itself together could be influenced by what happens here in the next couple of years. So those are the challenges we're facing. Let me take a couple questions now, and then I want to move right into our panel. But um, those are my kind of high-level comments. Questions in the back, yes? A little bit louder. Yeah, the question being, how do, how do we deal with, with the huge transmission uh, uh, problems that exist? Uh, th these problems exist everywhere. The answer, it's, it's a simple answer. It's complicated to implement. The simple answer is build more transmission. Uh, we formed a company a couple of years ago called Berkshire Hathaway Energy Transmission. Uh, we're building now with Pacificorp. Um, the Cal ISO in its planning has now approved the, Del oh, I'm sorry, has approved the Delaney to Colorado River project. There's got to be more transmission. We're looking at doing more transmission just to get into California with renewables to expand this energy and balance market. So folks are going to, we're either going to have to have regulators say build this because the Cal, Cal ISO will be taking bids for projects that it approves and ratepayers will pay for that. We're seeing merchant transmission uh, in other parts of the country. We may see some of that in California to deal with some of those bottlenecks and overcome the problems. You can't, there, there are folks who say you can't build enough transmission, and I know that is completely counterintuitive to microgrids and distributed generation that I didn't address here, but ultimately the, 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 with, 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 you can't love renewables and hate transmission. So if you're going to go to 50% renewables, there's going to be a need for more robust transmission. So it's got to be done. And yes, it's been a big challenge. I think the Cal ISO is doing a good job of addressing it. We'll hear from, uh, from one of its Board of Governor members on the panel and uh, maybe revisit the question. Other questions? Ooh, great. Because up, oh, yes. Thank you for going through the, the energy imbalance market. I have a question about the evolution of the energy imbalance market. It sounds like the Western system was very much like uh, the Southwestern power pool. It had a number of different grids. They started out with an energy imbalance market for a number of years, and they evolved into a full-blown uh, ISO market where they launched that last year. Do you envision uh, Pacific Corp and, and other things evolving to the California ISO to go to the full-blown uh, market, or do you still stay in the energy imbalance market for an extended period of time? Uh, question, if I heard you correctly, is, is well, will Pacific Corp morph from an energy imbalance market to just fully joining the ISO? Let me back up and explain to folks. When we, when we entered into this product with the, called the energy imbalance market, that, that did not mean becoming part of Cal ISO. We're still responsible for our reserve margins and the like. Um, it's much too early to say. Um, I will say that working with the Cal ISO has been um, an extraordinarily a uh, positive experience uh, for us. I think the, the Cal, ISO, Cal ISO feels the same way. We, we aimed for an October 1 go live. We kind of missed it by a month. We actually we did simulations starting in, in June 2014. It worked. The benefits are there. We're on target for NV Energy. It's much too early to say where that goes. If, if this can evolve to a day-ahead market, um, 
so much the better. Certainly the Southwest Power Pool has done a great job. I think there are a lot of people on the sidelines now just looking to see, okay, Pacific Corp, you're the canary in the coal mine. Is it really going to work? Are the benefits there? You know, am I just a used car salesman talking about all these great things that are going to happen? I don't think so, but there are doubters. Witness the fact that there's exactly one other utility, Puget Sound Energy, that is joined. And this concept has been out there for years. Uh, a lot of munis are concerned about, um, gosh, you start with an energy imbalance market, and before you know it, FERC is going to have its tentacles all over you, and you're going to be fully regulated from Washington, DC. That's a concern. Don't know how to deal with that. Um, other. There are, other, there are other entities in the Northwest that, that have you know, different ideas. So it's a little bit too early to say. I can only say that we think this makes sense. We see cost savings, not just for our customers, but for Cal ISO customers. So um, uh, we're on a good trajectory. Let me not eat into our panel's time. So thanks for that. But let me now call up our panel, because I want to take a number of these ideas and move them along. Thank you very much.